Hey, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the August 2022 version of the Wild Science webinar. Uh, thanks for taking some time to hear about the great work that our colleagues are doing all across the state. Uh, I would remind you that we are recording this meeting and it will be available publicly on the YouTube channel uh, here in a few days. Uh, please mute your microphones uh, while uh, while the presenters are speaking. And uh, if you have questions, we'll take those at the end. You can also type those into the chat function as always. Uh, so let's get started. Today we are going to be hearing from Maurice Jackson and Jeremy Wood. Maurice will be talking about the Family and Community Fishing Program uh, and its uh, recruitment, retention, and reactivation approach during the pandemic. And Jeremy will be talking about keeping track of wild turkeys in Arkansas. Uh, Maurice is going to be going first. Uh, for those of you who aren't as familiar with Maurice, he graduated from the University of Arkansas at Pine Bluff in 1997 with a bachelor's degree in fisheries biology. Maurice went on to earn a master's degree at UAPB in aquaculture fisheries in 2003. Started his career in May 2000 as a supervisor with uh, Alabama Wildlife and Freshwater Fisheries. Managed their largest hatchery for about six years and then worked another six years as Alabama's first aquatic education biologist. Uh, he's been with the Game and Fish Commission for 10 years, located in the Little Rock office, and has served as the Family and Community Fishing Program Coordinator since 2015. A couple of career highlights in 2017, the Family and Community Program uh, helped the agency earn uh, CIFWA's uh, Diversity and Inclusion Award for Outreach and Education. And then in 2019, uh, the program received the uh, American Fishery Society's Sport Fish Restoration Outstanding Project Award in the category of Aquatic Education. Uh, so here now to talk about the Family and Community Fishing Program and its R3 approach during the pandemic. Maurice Jackson. Thank you, Trey. Good morning, everybody. You're in business, Maurice, looking good. All right. So, um, when you think about R3, you, you, you uh, how we can recruit folks into the, our program as far as fishing. Um, my experience as a coordinator, um, I, I, I see us still stuck in phase one of this in this cartoon, um, hoping to get to phase, phase uh, two in the next uh, three to five years. <clears throat> Mark Duda with uh, Responsive Management um, had some insights on how to really deal with R3, and he's, uh, he offered these suggestions. Um, he thought that making um, R3 <clears throat> a, a big priority as far as creating a division within each agency would be, uh, would be the best bet as far as uh, recruiting more, more customers into uh, uh, the agency's programs. He, that, that division should be equal to wildlife, fisheries, and other divisions within that uh, division. He thought that if we didn't invest that time into, those, uh, into a marketing division, we, would, uh, we wouldn't do well. So for example, um, I, I dug a little deep into this and I found that uh, what the U.S. Small Business Administration recommends that we, we use between 6 to 12% of our gross income on, um, on marketing. Um, in the long run, in the end, it'll benefit, it'll benefit everyone. So let me give you a case study. Here, this is um, Anna. We met Anna about five years ago. Anna came to a trout event here in central Arkansas, had a good time. Uh, kept about, you know, she caught a lemon of fish, caught about 10 that day. Here's Anna again uh, five years later. I hadn't seen Anna since the, that, that trout event. So between that span of her being introduced, to, this is her at a catfish event, you know, if that well, there was an opportunity to market, you know, products that Game and Fish produces. I mean, of course, you got the Family Community Fishing Program, but you got a, a lot of other programs that her dad may be interested in. And doing that whole process, look, they even had another child. 
So when you think about the family community fishing program, of course we did. We 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 get, we're involved in a little of the marketing parts of uh, trying to get the word out about the program. But the program is nearly 25 years old. We have 49 locations. Um, of those 49 locations, we put you know they get stocked with trout, and we do this in a seasonal fashion. We also do tag fish to to keep our anglers engaged, um, and we also are known for some of our outreach events. And we've had events that had up to 5,000 people. Um, some of our colleagues have coined us the, the, the face of R3. Just myself there and uh, my colleague, uh, Clint Coleman. So we're involved in, you know, a lot of aspects of the program. Um, here's one of our new locations that, that's under construction right now. We got one of our biologists, we work with them and developing these locations. That's where he's standing actually where the boat ramp's gonna go in. And here's another project that we finished up that we kind of came in on the tail end. They contacted us and said, hey, we got this pond that we're building. Uh, would you guys come out and give us some advice on it? By the time we got there, they dug a 30-foot hole. I said, why y'all dig the hole so deep? They said, well, we can put more fish in there. I was like, no, nah, it, it doesn't work that way. But we eventually got it all figured out and moved on some other, some other things. So during COVID, uh, we actually celebrated opening of several locations this is one of our newest locations in redfield got a lot of hugs uh during COVID during that time celebrating these locations there's never been a city to call us back and tell us to come back and get the fish once we establish these locations they're there they're there love them uh during COVID, we created this pond locator tool which is a pretty useful tool for our anglers we want them to get there easily and safely without having to go in, going through obstacles now all our locations are not on this on this map, this was created by GIS division, but we're working on getting all the locations on there. And so here's a, a blow up of uh, Pulaski County. Pulaski County has more locations than any other part of the region of the state. And if you think about other states like Texas, Texas uh, has about four locations in the Dallas Fort Worth area servicing 7 million people. So we're kind of blessed to be able to hit the game as far as getting locations out before the areas are overdeveloped. So uh, Northwest Arkansas is our next area of focus to get more locations. Uh, if you click on one of these numbers, uh, it'll take you to the, you know, you got a cool little picture showing highlighting that, that, that location. Um, the, 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 part, the pond mapping tool actually produces some data for us. And it actually shows you how the, the use of that map when people, uh, when we start our, season, our seasons. So for example here, we start trout season around the middle of September. And you notice um, there's traffic, people using that tool. And around this time, right before Christmas, we'll stock the fish, we'll stock tag fish for trout but to get our anglers out and about and uh, introduce new people to the program. And, and this little bump here is another uh, way we, we advertise through our regular channels to uh, get folks to, to the ponds. But if you notice in catfish season, you see all these big spikes. So this is the first part of the month this past season that we actually put out digital ads promoting uh, that the ponds are stocked. And then you got the second part of the month in May is when we put the tags out. Now we're giving away eight uh, tags that are worth $800. If you send in a, and the grand prize was a, a guided fishing trip. And if you, if, if you follow this map, uh, these little stuff, spikes here, these are different events we did around the state and different ads that we're running through that season. And so last year we had 109,000 people to use this, um, this map, but it was used 5,000 times. But this past season we had 109,000 um, uses out of this map. Of course, um, you know, like Trey mentioned earlier, we won several awards as far as um, getting the program out, information about the program. We're probably the best in the nation when it comes to uh, outreach. Um, um, <clears throat> and we also involved with the AFS Hutton Scholars. That's something we added to our plate just recently and they're trying to look, uh, engage the next generation of fishery scientists. And we're the first to uh, create this uh, sign, sign in Spanish as well to reach out to uh, our Northwest Arkansas partners. We're the first to do an in uh, partner with education to do an in house, I mean, uh, studio interview about the program, promote an event in Northwest Arkansas. And you got to understand uh, when you're doing these outreach events, a lot of times we're the first 
person from Game and Fish that people get exposed to. On that first photo, this is Gary Casey. He, he's probably taking more people fishing in Central Arkansas um, than any person I know. Um, he's he's the founder of the Big Catch. He actually got involved with the program through our tag fish. He called our tag a tag fish, and it, the rest is history. And from photo number two, the enforcement officer in the middle. I met him at a trout uh, clinic and. He was telling me at the time, as he was a sophomore in college, he was going to be a game warden. Sure enough, and I came back and did the Trout Derby two years later. <laughs> there he is as an enforcement officer. Then at photo three is actually Rick Fields. Rick Fields, we recruited him from uh, out of central Arkansas, in Little Rock. He's a Pulaski County enforcement officer. Again, um, these events, we're excellent. We're experts at getting the folks to these events. But one of the things you want to think about, what happens after the, after the event? Are people interested in other activities? other than uh, the family community fishing program. So when we're doing these events, this is an event at the Big Catch. We may have 45 vendors at these events. Uh, we even did COVID shots this past uh, 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 last spring, spring 2021. Again, you'll see the people from different backgrounds uh, attending these events. Again, what happens, What? how do we market and how do we uh, get products that are these that people are interested in uh, after these events. That's that's the biggest hurdle. It's like you see all the stuff going on in the background. People say, "Well, y'all got a lot of stuff going on." I said, "Well, yeah, uh, that's just to get people there." You notice the young man there uh, putting livers on. He's actually trying to catch a catfish. He's going to catch a catfish before we get on the on the bounce house. Of course, there's food. It's a veterans organization providing food. A lot of these events are free. Um, and again, once you know you have all these people emerged uh, at these events, but what happened from between? This is a photo from back in 2018. How are we able to stay engaged with them? That's going to require marketing. People love these events. Who to say you know that they wouldn't enjoy us? Uh, you know, having some wild hog out there, somebody <laughs> educating them about. Um, you know, issues with that in the state. So we learned a lot with um, the Big Catch and we, and we later decided to do, create our own event uh, program, which is the Family Fun Day events. Um, and we wanted to create it something around fishing, offer uh, these activities. Again, fishing was the draw. And we start, it took us a year to develop this. So we looked at areas around the state and we target these areas um, on, for, based on certain criteria, we also wanted to create some images that were that were that was inviting, um, that was welcoming to the people that was that were seeing the the, the advertisements. We also created our own web uh, registration page, both in English and Spanish, and we were the first to do that. So, very useful, fr friendly um, uh, tool that was created through our uh, IT division. Again, it took a while to get all this stuff together before we actually went live with it in 2018. So you can register for one of these trips or prizes once you register. You had to pick one of these before you can even finish the registration. So in 2018, if you notice Grandview, people picked Grandview. They wanted to go to Grandview to experience the whole, you know, a lot of things that Game and Fish had to offer. Then, of course, fishing came in number two. Now, me being a fisheries biologist, I would have went for the fishing trip. So depending on who you talk to about R3, you'll get a different response. So like in 2022, this is four years later, we still see the same thing. This is 59.1%. People still want to do the, uh, the do Grandview. Then fishing came in at a strong number two. And again, we have a lot of women coming to these events. Uh, nationally, 30 some percent women participate in fishing. But here with these events, we're, we're blowing them out the way. Women are involved in this, 62%. Again, um, I, I providing you know these images of people doing different things is what what I think what drives them. This lady here, she actually traveled to all our family fun day events. We held three in different regions of the state. And one of the cool things about this photo, she's one of the rare that actually targeting other different other species other than what we have in our ponds. This young man won. One of our first individuals that won a trip, 
on our family fun days. This is about four years ago. I hadn't been in contact with them since. This lady here, this young, this man, he actually won a hunting trip. And he, when I talked with him, he said, hey, man, um, I want to take my dad. He's getting elderly. And I also want to take my daughter. My wife goes hunting, but she, you know, she just sits in the deer stand. So this young lady actually caught, killed her first deer. Last spring, I mean, last fall, after um, doing the big catch, they all, we offered hunts. And this landowner here um, sponsored the, the hunt. We had education involved in this. This, this uh, young lady here actually went to hunt too. She won that trip. But that young man was fishing for catfish in September, and he killed his first deer last November. Okay, when we when we wanted to market the family fun days, we used whatever available, uh, whatever media outlet that the Game and Fish had at the time, newsletter, magazine, the website. The game changer in 2018 was the social media. So people, when they uh, when we surveyed them after the events. They said that they found out about the event through social media. And just to give you an example, so when we stocked the ponds, we didn't advertise the family fun day until like two weeks later. And if you notice, the reach and impressions actually build up and people came from all over, you know, the surrounding counties because those ads when you run them, they bleed over into some of these neighboring counties. And as far as emails and texts and want to stay in contact, we, we figured this out that people want to be involved and know more about the program back then. I know y'all see a lot of this on the website now, our uh, main website, we're trying to register folks for, um, you know, getting emails and information like that, harvesting that data. So we look back at the license sales back in 2017 when we didn't do the events, the family fund days, and compared to 2018 night license sales, and there was an increase. And in those cities where we did those events, not only were the license sales increased that month, they can they was increased the following month as well because of the ads we put out there. Now Springdale is a different. That's a whole nother market that really needs to be looked into. Now the reason why that 2017 is um, off to there's a lot more people buying licenses because we just opened that new location up. It's been closed for like three years. But if we hadn't went to Springdale. In 2018, it's a possibility that that license sale number would have been probably decreased. Um, and that's 400 some people that we, you know, you that are gone. That's four years ago. So we looked at some other marketing campaigns that other states are doing. This is Pennsylvania uh, Fish and Boat Commission back in 2020. They did a ads, ran ads, digital ads, trying to promote their trout. Now we couldn't, we didn't, we didn't have for budget issues, we couldn't even promote our trout during that same year. But we did make up for it with catfish. So April, catfish went out. You notice this tick in license purchases. May, when the tag we, we promoted stockings and the tag trout, I mean tag catfish, and then you still got this bump and it continue all the way through June, but we were still advertising tag fish and uh stockings. And so that same year, if you looked at the, the license purchases directly from catfish promotions, 38,000 licenses were sold with a license purchase value of over a million. So here's a sample of some of those media ads we put out during 2021. Now again, um, I'm just offering my perspective as a coordinator of one of the most popular programs in the nation. Um, Right now, you know, we're we're still at phase one. I mean, but we can we can do better. I think uh, to get to phase two, we probably want to really consider what uh, Mark Doodle had to say back in 2017 about you know having your own marketing division to really be able to track folks. Um, you know, what we do is seasonal. You have people coming and going um, throughout throughout the throughout the year. And be more systematic about it. Uh, you got to think about it. We're talking about catfish. That's we have other products we want to promote to the people. Trout. We have brim. Some of our ponds are starting to see uh, that you know they're overcrowded with brim because we're not marketing that. And of course, we have some some of the some of the best largemouth bass fishing. Now, uh, marketing. You want to look at look at other groups, underrepresented uh, minority groups. That's a market. And of course, getting stuff put in Spanish so we can uh, communicate with that group. Email, text, alerts, I think, 
from a program standpoint, we should be able to send emails and text alerts out to uh, um, about the, just the program itself. I mean, just programs in general around the whole agency. And then you got license sales analysis. What zip code is buying license? What zip code is it? And then possibly even often employees incentives. Um, if you do an event, 500, 600 people are just doing an event in general, and people are buying licenses, and you're doing these events annual, annually. What about offering a, uh, you know, a bonus? We used to get bonuses uh, doing our value, you know, once a year, that one-time bonus, and maybe give the hatchery folks a percentage of that, because without the fish, you can't, uh, you can't <laughs> recruit folks. Again, a big thanks for a lot of folks that help help the program grow. Um, basically the whole division and then of course our partners we have all our locations at 30 36 cities statewide and with that i'll take questions all right thank you maurice uh i did see i know, saw that uh holly sanders had a comment and i'll read it for the record here uh it said uh, this pond locator tool with the photos it's great for knowing specifically how accessible fishing ponds are. I've used it several times to pre-plan a trip for people that are mobility impaired. All right, thanks for that comment, Holly. Uh, any questions? Maurice, how does how does uh, the Family and Community Fishing Program's uh, R3 efforts uh, with fishing, uh, how, how does that differ or, or how are they similar from other state agencies? Well, we get a lot of questions. I mean, you know, we have, you have to understand we have the ability, our funding is different compared to a lot of states. Um, you know, being able to, you know, not only just stock fish seasonally um, and actually doing the events that we do, uh, you know, engaging people at that one time, you know, one time events like that around the state, that's, that's critical in getting the word out about, about your program. A lot of states don't do that. Okay, thanks, Maurice. Uh, Christopher Wyatt uh, asks, should we encourage city officials to reach out to the program about their city ponds, or do you prefer to contact them selectively? Well, right now we're we're targeting, um, you know, counties that have 25,000 or more, and we're just about in every county. People will go to a stock pond within, you know, a 30 minute, you know, drive. Uh, encouraging you know that's you know that's that's pretty much how we the system we have in place now okay anybody else got questions all right maurice thank you very much good presentation and uh, we appreciate you being here today to, to talk about the program uh thank let's move on thanks maurice uh let's move on to jeremy wood who will be talking about uh keeping track of wild turkeys in arkansas that's uh, kind of part of his job uh, jeremy uh, is our turkey program coordinator uh, he's an avid wow. turkey hunter as well and has been with the agency since uh, 2018. he's the current chair of the southeast wild turkey working group and also serves as the arkansas up for the National Wild Turkey Federation Technical Committee. Uh, both of those groups are composed of turkey biologists across the Southeast and the nation, respectively. Prior to coming to work for Game and Fish in 2018, Jeremy worked as the Assistant Wild Turkey Program Coordinator for the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission. Uh, he received his graduate degree from the University of Georgia in 2017, where he researched the impacts of prescribed fire activities on wild turkey reproduction. Once again, Jeremy will be talking today about keeping track of wild turkeys in Arkansas. Jeremy, the floor is yours. All right, thanks, Trey. And hopefully everybody won't hear the uh, loud noises in the background. Apparently the neighbors are getting uh, fiber optic cable laid right now. So hopefully that won't be uh, coming in on the, the background noise. But we'll get this to pull up. I think we should be looking good. All right, so to kind of start off, I mean, obviously Trey mentioned I'm the Turkey Program Coordinator for the state, and, you know, overview of the talk today is kind of to, to look at how we, we keep track of wild turkey populations here in the state, and somewhat of a, you know, call to action for folks, because, you know, 
only way we can keep track of wild turkey populations is through a lot of input from both agency staff and, and from the public. And you can't not talk about, you know, the history of wild turkey populations when, when you try to have a, a talk like this. And, you know, historically, you know, prior to the 1900s, you know, early settlers and naturalists that moved through Arkansas, you know, wrote about and indicated that there's fairly abundant turkey populations here in the state. And, but then over time, you know, as European colonization moved westward, Arkansas began to become more settled. We started seeing, you know, here and then likewise in other states that, you know, these populations were starting to take a hit, you know, through unregulated market hunting, subsistence hunting, um, habitat degradation and loss, you know, broad scale conversion of, you know, particularly like in the East Arkansas, um, conversion of bottomland hardwoods into, you know, agricultural fields that, you know, immediately wiped out some of the turkey habitat that was around. And, you know, because of this, it was noted, you know, fairly early on, you know, in the agency's um, existence, you know, Arkansas Game and Fish Commission was established in 1915 and, and started to implement some of the first regulations, you know, on bag limits and seasons for different species, started establishing state game refuges, and, you know, also started some of the first limited enforcement of those regulations. Um, you know, noting that populations appeared to be declining, you know, restoration efforts were, were one of the, of turkeys were one of the first efforts, you know, this agency started to initiate. And a lot of those early efforts were reliant on captive raised game farm turkeys, you know, basically wild birds that were raised in captivity um from egg laying all the way up through the time they could be released so they hatched they were raised and then when they got big enough agencies put them out and this happened in arkansas this happened across the country and, and unfortunately you know those birds don't have the appropriate social structure the the wary wariness of natural predators and you know, those birds eventually accounted for for next to nothing as far as as the rebound of turkey populations were concerned um by the 1940s there was only estimated to be about 7,000 turkeys left in arkansas most of these in pockets in the you know gulf coastal plain dallas and grant county and kind of outward from there some pockets in along the mississippi river and shea and lee counties in the east and then up around you know boone marion carroll county and the northern ozarks and it wasn't until the late 40s and the early 1950s that, you know, cannon netting techniques were developed that allowed for the capture of wild birds and their natural habitat, you know, like this image on the top left, birds getting caught in a net. This is in a modern rocket net, but that was just a variation on, on these older cannon netting techniques and what we use nowadays for, for research. And then you put those birds into boxes like on the bottom left. And they were used to, to transport those birds within the state or potentially from other states or out of state. Um, you know, there was, there was a lot of birds being moved around between the 60s, you know, 50s, you know, on into the early 2000s in a lot of states as their restoration efforts were, were ramping up. And overall, there was about, only about 7,000 wild turkeys restocked across the state. There's a few more when you incorporate all of those, those game farm turkeys. Um, however, again, those didn't really come out to much. And in the end, you know, this was deemed a relative conservation success story, you know, here in the state and, and a lot of other states. And so you see, you know, when we look at our spring turkey harvests over time, going back into the early 60s, you'll see that, you know, harvests were increasing steadily during this restoration period. And the majority of Arkansas's restocking efforts were done by the early 2000s. There was a few minor stockings up until about 2012 but but you see that we hit this high point in 2003 and then populations or, or harvest you know begin to show some declines and obviously that's got managers it's got hunters you know alike concerned about what's going on but it leads you to you know trying to figure out you know how do you you know attempt to, to monitor populations and you know do you use harvest do you use other methods what are some of the, the challenges with, with looking at those different metrics to, to really tease out how your populations are doing? 
And so with that, you know, there's several different ways that you, know, you can monitor turkey population and, and other wildlife species for, uh, um, and those are things like censuses, estimates, and, and indices. And I'm going to touch upon those those briefly and some of the reasons why turkey populations here in the state, and then what what we do try, attempt to utilize to to monitor turkey populations. So the first being a census, and this is this is probably the most ideal um, estimate that you could use. And you know, it's, the idea of it is to, to get a total population count. You know exactly how many birds or individuals in the population you're working with. And you know, this can work in relatively limited situations. You know, you get into some more arid environments like Texas and the desert southwest, where roost sites are much more limiting than they are here in Arkansas. That you have very large communal roosts. They're fairly, you know, separated from each other. Um, so you can go out and you can actually get counts of those roosts and look at them over time to see, you know, are they increasing, are they decreasing? And likewise, you can do something similar in, in some of the northern climates. You, know, you get up to Minnesota and Wisconsin, Michigan, and areas like that where they get a decent amount of snow cover in the wintertime. And that tends to concentrate birds on some agricultural areas, looking for waste grain, things that are, you know, they, they need a more concentrated food source at that point, point in time just to sustain themselves. You know, they're at the kind of the extreme of, of their range. And so this allows, you know, managers to attempt to count birds in big flocks in these areas with the expectation that there's relatively limited movement um, at that time. But there really isn't a lot of feasibility for this here in Arkansas. You know, as many of you are aware, we're a relatively forested environment. We don't get a lot of, you know, extreme weather events during the winter and because of that you know birds are, are hard to find they're hard to see um, you can't just go out and expect to see them every time you're moving about the landscape in particular from a roosting standpoint you know almost every forested area in Arkansas almost any tree could be be utilized as a roost and so they're a lot more spread out they tend to be smaller and it's harder to, to attempt to, to count birds in those areas. And so moving on, the next you know possibility you can use is is estimates, and, and these are basically you're taking a sample from the population and using it and expecting it to be representative of the entire population. Use that to estimate that that total population size, and you know you can use things like aerial counts. We use these for you know some big game species like elk, where you run transects and based on the number of individuals and the, the sex ratios that you see you're able to, to estimate the population based on the area that you're covering same thing can be said about transect surveys these are pretty similar to those aerial counts but done on the ground um, mark recapture surveys which are can be really good you get out and you actively you catch some birds or animals you mark them whether you know with a band on their leg potassial tags on their wings of something that you can identify those individuals and then in successive attempts to recapture those you, you weigh the number of recaptures versus the number of birds that are, are new and try to estimate your population that way but the problem again being that a lot of these can be intensive they can be relatively expensive and again detectability is is difficult you know you've got birds again in, in a very forested environment so you know like this bird here on the lower right that has an alphanumeric color band on it. You can read that the number is A2, but if you don't get that bird popping up enough on cameras, and we, we've done this recently with the University of Arkansas of Monticello attempting to estimate male density, you know, if you don't get those birds popping up on enough cameras, it's really difficult to, to tease out what that density may be. So we tend as a state and a, and a lot of states throughout the country to put more focus on things like indexes or indices that you know basically what these are is they're, they're taking some sort of a measurable factor that you can monitor trends within it um, we use things like spring and fall hunter observation surveys harvest surveys so looking at how many birds are, are killed in a given county the sex ratios looking at, at summertime brood surveys and, and i'm going to focus primarily on these last two to Kind of just show you some of what we use to, to monitor turkey populations here in the state and some of the challenges that that exist within each of these 
so you know when we talk about harvest indices we we're looking at that total harvest but you know if, if someone were to just look at our harvest over time they would probably deduce that it appears that our, our turkey population has declined nearly 65 percent and you've probably seen this in some popular news articles over the last several years but the problem is that you know harvest alone is not a good predictor of population trends doesn't take into account things like changes in season timing or season length. So this graph that just popped up, you have harvest on the y-axis on the left, represented by the red line, and then you have the date on the y-axis on the right, represented by the, the yellow bars, which indicate the duration of the hunting seasons and the timing of the hunting seasons. And you'll note that you know, prior to 2000, we had a relatively stable season structure. We had about 23 to 25 days. Populations appeared to be increasing. Harvest was increasing. But then we kind of threw a wrench in it in the early 2000s, and season length was expanded considerably. We went up to 35 to 39-day season lengths. And then with that, our harvest numbers did, did increase. There was more time available to, to hunt, but we started, you know, going down on the back end. And that successfully led to, you know, we're seeing declines in harvest. We then saw declines in season length to attempt to stabilize that harvest. And, you know, so those are things that aren't factored in when you just simply look at the, the harvest numbers. Likewise, you know, it doesn't take into account things like bag limits, be able to take definitions, hunter effort and preferences. We just, here in Arkansas, we don't know how many hunters we have, how often they go out anything like that. Um, as far as the bag limits are concerned, this new graph that popped up, you've got a harvest again on the y-axis. Um, you've got total harvest in red, adult gobbler harvest in yellow, and jake harvest in green. And what you'll note is over time, prior to the year 2000, jake harvest was unrestricted. You could take as many jakes as you wanted as part of your um, season limit. In 2000, the agency initiated a, a one jake limit for all hunters. So regardless of age, you were allowed to take one jake as part of your two bird limit. And then from 2011 to now, we've had what's known affectionately as the, the no jake rule, which is restricted jake harvest to one bird for youth hunters age six to 15. And what you'll note over time is, you know, prior to 2000, jake harvest made up nearly 40% of the harvest on average each year, followed by the the one jake period where it was making up about 25 percent of the harvest and then nowadays it makes up about four percent of the harvest so those declines in jake harvest have an extreme impact on the number of birds that we're taking each year and imp impact you know what our overall harvest is and if you were not taking these into account you wouldn't really understand what's what's going on with the population you think we're declining at a much more rapid rate than we probably are so with that, we don't want to put, you know, all of our eggs in one basket, you know, pun intended there, but, um, you know, we want to look at what else impacts turkey population. And some of the most impactful factors to turkey population growth are things like nest success, adult female survival, and poult survival. But, you know, how, how can we get at these metrics without monitoring and, and handling birds? what can we measure then you know regards to that obviously these are all easy things that we can get a hold of if we go out and spend the time to capture birds in the winter time but again that's really cost prohibitive to do that and do that everywhere in the state so what can we measure and that that's going to lead me into this this idea of, of brood surveys and this wild turkey population survey that we've we've been doing since the early 80s the goal of the survey is annual reproduction and eventually develop a, a reproductive indus, index that uh, I'll get to at the end of the presentation here. But the survey was instituted in the early 80s. Um, up until about 2018, this was primarily composed of natural resource professionals. So that was agency staff, uh, non-agency partners like um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, US Forest Service, other NGO partners like Nature Conservancy, National Wild Turkey Federation. It was all done in a paper for survey form. In 2019, based on some of the research that we're seeing in the Southeast, 
suggested that really the data that we we're obtaining, we we're, we're limiting ourselves by only limiting it to natural resource professionals. You can get just as good a data um, from all members of the public and you can increase the potential you know, information you had to work with by, by involving those individuals. And with that, we instituted an electronic survey because it allows for more real-time tracking and up-to-date information throughout the season rather than a paper record that we wouldn't necessarily receive till you know a month after the observations were made or at the end of the season you know so that three month period and there's a lot of risk to having those sheets lost or damaged um, this way we get all that information as it comes in and what individuals do is they're recording all of the individual turkeys that they see when they're out whether that's a you know, a single female, like here in this image, you know, pulling up to a WMA gate to a closed access road, or if it's a group of adult gobblers or a group of, of hens with a bunch of poults out there, you record each of those observations independently. We have multiple survey options now, depending on what option fits your needs. So we have the Arkansas GIS, or ArcGIS Survey 123 field app, which provides some offline capability. Um, so if you're outside of cell service often, this can be your, your best bet. Also, you know, many of you likely have the Game and Fish mobile app on your phone for checking deer, checking turkeys. There's a tab under there for wildlife observations. There's multiple surveys. There's deer hunter observations, monarch butterfly tracking. Um, hogs, but there's also one for turkey and quail population survey. And then lastly, you know, if you, you spend more time on the computer, you can go on the AGFC website, agfc.com slash turkey surveys, and you can pull up the survey dashboard where you get an introduction, a link to the survey itself, and then as well as some some dashboards that allow for, for real-time data tracking, allows you to see where your information is going. It keeps track of all the submissions that we get, the different breakdown of the age classes that are observed and observed by county. And what you'll note is within the survey, you know, you're asked for fairly specific location information, but again, being a turkey hunter, I, I'm aware that, you know, it's, it's a, it's a hard sell to, to give up locations of individuals. And so I'm very cautious about how, how that data is shared with the public. We only do that at a county level basis so that you don't have to worry about, you know, how your information is shared. We use those locations on the back end to help better under our better our understanding of distribution and hopefully in time we'll be able to tie that to you know a measure of density or or relative abundance and compare that to habitat suitability within the state so we can better focus our management efforts to areas that need it most and where we can get the most bang for our buck. So all that being said, you know, what, what do we get out of it? What do you get out of it? Um, you know, at the end of the day, we're developing this reproductive index, which is known as the, the pulp per hen index. And what you'll see here is pulp per hen on the y-axis on the left, represented by the yellow line, and harvest, again, represented by the red line on the y-axis on the right. And you'll note through time from the initiation of this survey that pulp or hen indices, you know, relatively high and were declining from the get-go. And that's likely due to some, some artifact of populations being low. The more birds you were seeing, the higher probability that you're seeing larger groups of, of poults and there's fewer hens running around that didn't. But Things have kind of stabilized and you know through time they've suggested that a pulp per hen index of, of two pulps per hen is likely needed to to stabilize or, or see slightly increasing populations and you'll note since the early 2000s there's only been one year that we've achieved that level at a statewide level and that was 2012 and successfully you saw harvest increase for several years following that but there are likely other factors that go into it than just looking at pulp per hen. Um, again, adult survival, nest success, all those things probably fluctuate to some degree and allow that, that pulp per hen index to be a little bit higher, a little bit lower um, when you get to that stable or slightly increasing. So the hope is that you know some of our recent improvements in in brood survival or pulp per hen indices moving from around one pulp per hen to one and a half that we're starting to see some positive improvements 
in our population. And likewise, when you look at this just at 2021, you'll note that you know we are still seeing some areas or regions within the state that do achieve that two pole per hen mark, but statewide, when you average it all out, it's obviously a bit lower. And, and lastly, as we start to finish up the presentation here, I'm gonna move a little bit quicker, but you know, there are still concerns with, with those estimates. And a lot of that revolves around how much participation we're seeing, how many observations we get. And so one of the goals that I've had since starting was rectifying these particip persistent participation concerns. You know, early on, it was noted that, you know, we had steady declines in survey participation and observations prior to 2019. And so what can we do about that? We opened that up to the public and, and as such, we've started to see an increase in trend here. Likewise, you know, the data that we're getting is has been clustered. In 2018, when I started, nearly half the data was coming from only 10% of the counties in the state. Now, in the last few years, we've increased that to about 45% of the data coming from 15 to 20% of the counties in the state. So still not great, but we're, we're moving in a positive direction there. And likewise, we're seeing a shift in participation, which, which should be what we would expect as we improve our communications and get the survey information out there more. But we're shifting from participation from natural resource professionals towards the public in most of our counties. You know, early on, it takes a little bit for people to uptake the survey, find out about it. But we're seeing that shift from blue to pink over time. And that makes sense because we have relatively few um, natural resource professionals in the state. We have many, 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 many more turkey hunters in the state. And so I hope that in time, this, this map looks like it's all pink and that we're still getting our agency participation, but we're getting a lot more um, participation from the public. And with that, um, that just kind of leaves me at that kind of that call to action. Um, you know, as you saw, we have about 250 participants, you know, annually right now. That's about half of the employees we have in the agency, but it's it's less than a percent of the turkey hunters we, we have here in the state. So even if we got one or two observations from every turkey hunter that was out there throughout the summertime, we would have so much more data to work with and understand what our populations were doing in a, in a more accurate sense than trying to extrapolate based on a lot fewer observations. So with that, I'll take any questions. And if you're interested in participating, you can either follow the link at the bottom of the screen or scan the QR code. And with that, take any questions. All right. Uh, thanks, Jeremy. Uh, how about questions? Uh, I've, I've got a couple, I know, but uh, I always jump in with mine. So I'll let others uh, type anything into the comment box or pose those questions now. Anybody? Jeremy, I think the natural question and uh, one that turkey hunters who may watch this later will want to know, where are we, how are we tracking with uh, both observations and, uh, and uh, some, you know, brood survey stuff uh, right now? I mean, what, uh, what, what's going on on the landscape right now? Yeah, so, I mean, so far, based on the numbers we have, you know, things are looking good. They're looking, you know, comparable to the last couple of years, which have been a, a significant improvement over the 2015 to 2019 time period. I mean, those were four of the five lowest reproductive years on record during that period. Um, so the last couple of years have been significantly better. I'm hearing a lot better reports from folks on the ground. They're seeing more birds, kind of excited where things are headed. Um, but likewise, you know, the number of observations that we've got is, you know, a little bit lower than we've had the last couple of years. So we're hoping that we can can get a few more of those. The this, the timing of this uh, presentation was, was pretty good. We still got one month left in the, the time period for the survey. So and most of the, you know, particularly the young birds that are seen at this point in time, they tend to be older. They're a little bit easier to see. And the likelihood is they're, they're probably going to be recruited in the population. They get past two, three weeks of age, their, their survival goes up a lot. So the more birds we get during July and August that are recorded, the better better our estimates are and the better um, we can assess what that population status is looking like. So, so far so good, but you know, like I say, it could be a little bit better as far as the, the observations. So I would, I would encourage folks if they have been seeing them and haven't been putting them in to, to put them in for sure. 
All right. Thanks, Jeremy. Anybody else? Any more questions before we wrap this thing up? All right. Uh, Jeremy Wood, thank you so much. Maurice Jackson, thank you. And thank you to everyone here on this uh, call, this meeting, who uh, took some time out of your day uh, to hear about a couple of great programs going on here at the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. We'll see you next month for the September version of the Wild Science webinar. Take care, everybody.